Hello, Sublation Media viewers and future readers. This week's Critical Cuts video returns us to the project of reading Guy Debord's book, Society of the Spectacle, backward. But it will also include an examination of the 1998 Academy Award-winning film, The Truman Show, as it's juxtaposed against the 1967 ITV television series, The Prisoner. Guy Debord's book, The Society of the Spectacle, also arrived in 1967. A French attempt to grapple with post-war consumerism, Debord's book offered an explanation for why the prospect for revolution seemed so distant. He suggested that the whole world, and certainly the developed world, had been transformed into a spectacle. Put differently, all the world had become a stage and all the men and women merely players. We were no longer able, either collectively or individually, of writing our own lines or creating our own future, but were instead following a script for a show nobody wanted or liked, but that everybody had to watch. In Chapter 5 of Society of the Spectacle, DeBoard explained how our lack of agency under capitalism changed our collective relationship with the passage of time. Let me tell you a story about the beginning. Some 15 billion years ago, our universe began with the mightiest explosion of all time. In modern times, the universe appears to be massive, stretching out either infinitely or to such a distance as to be unfathomable. The same is true of our current conception of time. We live within a stream of time that either stretches back indefinitely and forever, or within a universe that is older than we can truly understand. But the board points out that the only vantage point from which one can take in this immense historical totality is from within human history. It was a modern telescope whose power enabled us to look back in time at the receding nebulas at the periphery of the universe, for instance. Time has existed for as long as its existence has existed, but understanding the time of the universe as a natural history is new. It was only after we humans discovered our relationship to time, after the historicization of humanity brought about through the mediation of a society, that the universe itself gained a history. What was an unconscious movement of time became something conscious. First, we conceived of time as circular or cyclical. Even after agrarian societies produced technologies and language, even after we realized that the world was a product of our own history and labor, we remained stuck within a mythical world based on fixed concepts and social roles. The agrarian mode of production governed by the rhythm of the seasons, was a mode of production that produced cyclical time. Changes might have occurred, but always predictably. What had been in the past was always sure to return in the future. But as power became centralized and our societies grew, this cyclical view of time was replaced by what de Boer called a linear succession of powers and events. Time became irreversible. However, this irreversible time or history was owned and known only to the rulers. The rulers appropriated what de Boer called the temporal surplus value or the surplus of material that could be used to create political and social change. The ruling class alone possessed the irreversible time needed for a life that could be self-directed. The rest, living off of subsistence farming or as peasants, had no history and had no future. And they remained within cyclical time. Finally, with the rise of bourgeois society, we began to live within history or within irreversible time. The bourgeoisie broke with the aristocracy, 
broke with the idea that the universe was a reflection of an unchanging divine reality and imposed history upon the world. Yet even as this irreversible time, time understood as a process of change, became hegemonic, most of society was barred from participating. As a class of owners of the economy, the bourgeoisie was forced to repress the use of irreversible time. After all, under capitalism, change emanates from the business sector and the state. The societal demand to make use of irreversible time, to, to take up the power, change the world, and consciously create the future, our futures, should be understood as a demand for socialism. As the board put it in Society of the Spectacle, by demanding to really live the historical time that bourgeois society produced, the proletariat created a revolutionary project. And each previously defeated attempt to carry out this project represents a possible point of departure for a new historical life. However, de Boer's book is not optimistic or Pollyanna. It is not a celebration of socialism, but an attempt to explain why the socialist project has become difficult to maintain. It is an account of why society, and specifically the working class, keeps forgetting its history. That is, we not only forget the story or stories about the past, but worse, we forget that we are tasked to do something with this irreversible time we're living through. The board wanted to explain why the world and society had become alien to us, why it had become something we observed rather than directed or engaged with. How had we allowed ourselves to stop living and instead resigned ourselves to just watching as time left us behind? The board's description of pseudo-cyclical time in society the spectacle relies upon categories and jargon from the realm of bourgeois economics and from Marx's critique of political economy. He wrote about how pseudo-cyclical time arose as a disguise for the reality of commodity production. The board noticed that pseudo-cyclical time treats life as consisting of exchangeable units of value while suppressing all qualitative differences between one moment and the next. Most of all, this pseudo-cyclical time appears as something natural or reified. This world that we built appears as something that arose from nature or that was willed into existence by some divine entity. It is a world that we live with rather than a world that allows us to fully live. But what is most interesting about this pseudo-cyclical time is that it can't help but continuously alert us to the fact that this supposedly natural world can't be sustained and should be overcome. This bourgeois world is self-critical by nature. Our society and culture is a society of critique. Only the critiques are used to entertain and to pacify. For example, The Truman Show from 1999 takes up and illustrates the board's 1967 book even as it creates more pseudo-cyclical time for us to enjoy. The Truman Show is a story of a 30-year-old man whose whole life is a reality television program. Truman was born on a set and his life takes place within a dome a false ecosystem built so that the director of the program can control the weather along with all the actors and extras who populate the phony town of Sea Haven Island. Truman believes he is an ordinary man who sells insurance for a living, but he is in fact the star of the most popular and expensive television show in the world. What's most interesting about the Truman Show for a socialist, for a situationist like DeBoard maybe, is that the movie is not unique. It is part of a tradition of reality-questioning movies and television programs. For instance, 
It is quite similar to the Patrick McGowan vehicle, The Prisoner. In The Prisoner, a former spy is gassed and kidnapped, only to awaken in an exact duplicate of his London apartment. In both the TV show and the movie, the protagonist is surrounded by people acting in bad faith. In both The Prisoner and The Truman Show, the hero is under constant surveillance, and in both the show and the movie, the hero appears to be the most important person on the island or in the world. When we compare these two stories of a protagonist who discovers he's living in the spectacle, the difference between 1967 and 1998 become immediately apparent. For instance, in The Prisoner, the conspiracy against the agent known as Number Six might have been planned in the shadows by unknown forces, but the elaborate mind games and scenarios that they cook up in their lab are clearly conscious efforts made to break the will of the hero. Whereas in The Truman Show, conspiracy is an attempt to create normality out of strangeness. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Miss Lewinsky that was not appropriate. The prisoner starts off paranoid, while Truman nurses a secret alienation, a secret longing for another world, and only wakes up to the fact that his life is a lie, slowly, as his world falls apart around him. Perhaps the explanation for this difference is that in the 60s, the role the state played under Fordism, the way authority intervened in everyday life and civil society, was direct and obvious. Whereas by 1998, the neoliberal order had worked hard to make the state and its authority appear to be mostly invisible. And yet, despite these differences, the bourgeois critic of society nearly always takes recourse to a naturalized, authentic, normal world as a part of his or her solution. In the uh, final episode, does the prisoner really consider becoming uh, the leader of village? No. Uh, he does not. Uh, he just wants to get out. And he uses a technique which he hasn't used before that, which is violence. Which is sad, but he does. And that's how he gets out. And then, of course, in the final episode, he goes back to his little apartment place and he has his little ballet guy with him and the door opens on its own and he goes in cars there and that so you know it's going to start all over again because we continue to be prisoners at the end of the truman show after he fully realizes that the world he's living in is fake truman decides to escape he sets sail for the horizon and discovers that if he goes far enough he can literally touch the sky. Truman eventually finds the exit, and giving a bow to the director up in the heavens, he steps out into the real world. Only, there is no real world. Or put differently, there is no world that isn't also a fantasy. There is no world that we humans haven't had a hand in creating. As was mentioned at the beginning of this video, Natural history only arises within human history. And human history doesn't happen out there beyond us. But we individually and collectively create it. This means that our lives can only be lived within the mediating social structures that have been built historically. Or perhaps in those structures or relations that we build tomorrow. In the end, Truman reaches the exit. But in reality, there is no exit, and if we want to imagine a solution, we can't tell ourselves a story of escape. The solution isn't about breaking free from the unreality of the TV program we're trapped in, but rather, the solution will be when we storm the reality studio. Or, to put it in Marxist language, the solution would be to seize the means of production and to live through history.